For example, one day Ralph Waldo Emerson and his son tried to get a calf into the barn. But they made the common mistake of thinking only of what they wanted. Emerson pushed and his son pulled. But the calf was doing just what they were doing. He was thinking only of what he wanted. So he stiffened his legs and stubbornly refused to leave the pasture. The Irish housemaid saw their predicament. She couldn't write essays and books. But, on this occasion at least, she had more horse sense, or calf sense, than Emerson had. She thought of what the calf wanted. So she put her maternal finger in the calf's mouth and let the calf suck her finger as she gently led him into the barn. Every act you have ever performed since the day you were born was performed because you wanted something. How about the time you gave a large contribution to the Red Cross? Yes, that is no exception to the rule. You gave the Red Cross the donation because you wanted to lend a helping hand. You wanted to do a beautiful, unselfish, divine act. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Single quote. If you hadn't wanted that feeling more than you wanted your money, you would not have made the contribution. Of course, you might have made the contribution because you were ashamed to refuse or because a customer asked you to do it. But one thing is certain. You made the contribution because you wanted something. Harry A. Overstreet in his illuminating book Influencing Human Behavior said, Action springs out of what we fundamentally desire. Dot. Dot. And the best piece of advice which can be given to would-be persuaders, whether in business, in the home, in the school, in politics, is. First, arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Single quote. Andrew Carnegie. The poverty-stricken Scotch lad who started to work at two cents an hour and finally gave away $365 million. Learned early in life that the only way to influence people is to talk in terms of what the other person wants. He attended school only four years. Yet he learned how to handle people. To illustrate. His sister-in-law was worried sick over her two boys. They were at Yale, and they were so busy with their own affairs that they neglected to write home and paid no attention whatever to their mother's frantic letters. Then Carnegie offered to wager a hundred dollars that he could get an answer by return mail, without even asking for it. Someone called his bet. So he wrote his nephews a chatty letter, mentioning casually in a postscript that he was sending each one a five-dollar bill. He neglected, however, to enclose the money. Back came replies by return mail thanking, Dear Uncle Andrew, for his kind note and, you can finish the sentence yourself. Another example of persuading comes from Stan Novak of Cleveland, Ohio, a participant in our course. Stan came home from work one evening to find his youngest son, Tim, kicking and screaming on the living room floor. He was to start kindergarten the next day and was protesting that he would not go. Stan's normal reaction would have been to banish the child to his room and tell him he'd better make up his mind to go. He had no choice. But tonight, recognizing that this would not really help Tim start kindergarten in the best frame of mind, Stan sat down and thought, if I were Tim, why would I be excited about going to kindergarten? He and his wife made a list of all the fun things Tim would do such as finger painting, singing songs, making new friends. Then they put him into action. We all started finger painting on the kitchen table, my wife, Lil, my other son Bob, and myself, all having fun. Soon Tim was peeping around the corner. Next he was begging to participate. Oh, no. You have to go to kindergarten first to learn how to finger paint. With all the enthusiasm I could muster I went through the list talking in terms he could understand, telling him all the fun he would have in kindergarten. 
The next morning, I thought I was the first one up. I went downstairs and found Tim sitting sound asleep in the living room chair. What are you doing here? I asked. I'm waiting to go to kindergarten. I don't want to be late. The enthusiasm of our entire family had aroused in Tim an eager want that no amount of discussion or threat could have possibly accomplished. Single quote. Tomorrow you may want to persuade somebody to do something. Before you speak, pause and ask yourself. How can I make this person want to do it? Single quote. That question will stop us from rushing into a situation heedlessly, with futile chatter about our desires. At one time I rented the grand ballroom of a certain New York hotel for 20 nights in each season in order to hold a series of lectures. At the beginning of one season, I was suddenly informed that I should have to pay almost three times as much rent as formerly. This news reached me after the tickets had been printed and distributed and all the announcements had been made. Naturally, I didn't want to pay the increase, but what was the use of talking to the hotel about what I wanted? They were only interested in what they wanted. So a couple of days later I went to see the manager. I was a bit shocked when I got your letter, I said, but I don't blame you at all. If I had been in your position, I should probably have written a similar letter myself. Your duty as the manager of the hotel is to make all the profit possible. If you don't do that you will be fired and you ought to be fired. Now, let's take a piece of paper and write down the advantages and the disadvantages that will accrue to you, if you insist on this increase in rent. Single quote. Then I took a letterhead and ran a line through the center and headed one column, advantages, and the other column, disadvantages. Single quote. I wrote down under the head, advantages, these words. Ballroom free. Then I went on to say. You will have the advantage of having the ballroom free to rent for dances and conventions. That is a big advantage, for affairs like that will pay you much more than you can get for a series of lectures. If I tie your ballroom up for 20 nights during the course of the season, it is sure to mean a loss of some very profitable business to you. Now, let's consider the disadvantages. First, instead of increasing your income from me, you are going to decrease it. In fact, you are going to wipe it out because I cannot pay the rent you are asking. I shall be forced to hold these lectures at some other place. There's another disadvantage to you also. These lectures attract crowds of educated and cultured people to your hotel. That is good advertising for you, isn't it? In fact, if you spent $5,000 advertising in the newspapers, you couldn't bring as many people to look at your hotel as I can bring by these lectures. That is worth a lot for a hotel, isn't it? Single quote. As I talked, I wrote these two disadvantages under the proper heading and handed the sheet of paper to the manager, saying, I wish you would carefully consider both the advantages and disadvantages that are going to accrue to you and then give me your final decision. Single quote. I received a letter the next day, informing me that my rent would be increased only 50% instead of 300%. Mind you, I got this reduction without saying a word about what I wanted. I talked all the time about what the other person wanted and how he could get it. Suppose I had done the human, natural thing. Suppose I had stormed into his office and said, what do you mean by raising my rent 300% when you know the tickets have been printed and the announcements made? 300%. Ridiculous. Absurd. I won't pay it. Single quote. What would have happened then? An argument would have begun to steam and boil and sputter, and you know how arguments end. Even if I had convinced him that he was wrong, his pride would have made it difficult for him to back down and give in. 
Here is one of the best bits of advice ever given about the fine art of human relationships. If there is any one secret of success, said Henry Ford, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. Single quote. That is so good, I want to repeat it. If there is any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. Single quote. That is so simple, so obvious, that anyone ought to see the truth of it at a glance. Yet 90% of the people on this earth ignore it 90% of the time. An example. Look at the letters that come across your desk tomorrow morning, and you will find that most of them violate this important canon of common sense. Take this one, a letter written by the head of the radio department of an advertising agency with offices scattered across the continent. This letter was sent to the managers of local radio stations throughout the country. Opening parenthesis. I have set down, in brackets, my reactions to each paragraph. Closing parenthesis. Mr. John Blank, Blankville, Indiana. Dear Mr. Blank. The company desires to retain its position in advertising agency leadership in the radio field. Who cares about your company desires? I am worried about my own problems. The bank is foreclosing the mortgage on my house, the bugs are destroying the hollyhocks, the stock market tumbled yesterday. I missed the 8.15 this morning. I wasn't invited to the Joneses dance last night, the doctor tells me I have high blood pressure and neuritis and dandruff. And then what happens? I come down to the office this morning worried, open my mail and here is some little whippersnapper off in New York yapping about what his company wants. Bah! If he only realized what sort of impression his letter makes, he would get out of the advertising business and start manufacturing sheep dip. This agency's national advertising accounts were the bulwark of the network. Our subsequent clearances of station time have kept us at the top of agencies year after year. You are big and rich and right at the top, are you? So what? I don't give two whoops in Hades if you are as big as General Motors and General Electric and the general staff of the U.S. Army all combined. If you had as much sense as a half-witted hummingbird, you would realize that I am interested in how big I am, not how big you are. All this talk about your enormous success makes me feel small and unimportant. We desire to service our accounts with the last word on radio station information. You desire. You desire. You unmitigated ass. I'm not interested in what you desire or what the President of the United States desires. Let me tell you once and for all that I am interested in what I desire, and you haven't said a word about that yet in this absurd letter of yours. Will you, therefore, put the company on your preferred list for weekly station information, every single detail that will be useful to an agency in intelligently booking time? Preferred list. You have your nerve. You make me feel insignificant by your big talk about your company, and then you ask me to put you on a preferred list, and you don't even say, please, when you ask it. A prompt acknowledgement of this letter, giving us your latest doings will be mutually helpful.